So let's go ahead and talk about the New Testament manuscripts. We're going to have some other people filter in here in a little while as well. Um, I know that uh, Mimi and Stephen are out of town, and uh, that's all I can vouch for right now. Um, so, the New Testament was written from 50 to 100 AD. Compare that with the time frame of the Old Testament. How many years is the time span of the Old Testament being written? Over a thousand. Yeah, it's, it's right around a thousand. It's 1450 BC to about 400 BC. So it's about a thousand years. The New Testament, however, is written in a much shorter time frame. It is within 50 years. Okay, And that's that's really inclusive. Our first New Testament books are written uh, probably a little bit later than 50 AD. And the last New Testament book is written in about 96 AD. So I gave round numbers there, 50 to 100, a 50-year time span. So the time span of the Old Testament is considerably longer. I mean, lots longer. Okay, We're not talking about between 800 and 900 years. We're talking about 1,000 to 50 years. It's a considerable difference between the two. The New Testament was written originally entirely in Greek. Okay, Every New Testament book was written originally in Greek. There are some people that make the claim that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. There just really is not evidence for that. Okay, not solid evidence, not solid biblical evidence. Okay, um, the written, the New Testament was written originally in Greek. All of the, all of the writings, all of the Gospels, all of the letters, the Book of Acts, the Book of Revelation, all of those originally written in Greek. The predominant material used at first was papyrus. Okay, uh, papyrus is like um, the, the the paper of the ancient world. I mean, it is paper. Okay, and it would have been relatively less expensive. Um, then animal skins. Animal skins, there's a lot more involved in making animal skin into a surface for writing on, and so those usually represented more money. Um, papyrus was relatively cheaper, and so the predominant material at first was papyrus. Now, later copies are often on more durable materials. More durable materials meaning, in our particular case, parchment, animal skins, okay? Um, that had been turned into writing surfaces. Okay, scrolls of the Old Testament were mostly written on. Am I know animal skins. Okay, animal skins is a much more durable material. Papyrus is durable under certain circumstances. Okay, long term, dry environments. So where do we find papyrus usually? Egypt. Egypt is a huge source of papyrus, not only because it was uh, made there but also because the environment allowed it to be preserved. Um, another reason why papyrus was more uh, dominant at the beginning is because the New Testament originally written was a series of what? Letters, Letters and books. Okay, It's only going to be later on that it's collated together into the New Testament. And so at the very beginning, when you're talking about a book, Let's say the book of 3 John, the book of 3 John, the letter of 3 John, okay? John's third letter. It's very, very short. Probably would have gone on one sheet of papyrus. Maximum two, okay? Whereas other books would have been longer, but still very easy in a papyrus form. Later, when the New Testament is brought together and all the writings are brought together to form a collection of then you're going to see these codexes that are made out of more durable material. And we'll see some pictures here in a little... I think we'll see some pictures. We already did earlier, so um, it's the same same kind of thing. You can use animal skins to make a codex as well. All right? So, um, from Greek, the writings of the New Testament were translated into other ancient languages, such as Syriac, Latin, Coptic, Gothic, and so on. The New Testament was a very widely translated book, or the writings of the New Testament were very widely translated. Syriac is another of the ancient languages there in the New Testament period. Of course, Latin is the language of who? The Romans. The Romans, but really predominantly the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire, the dominant language there was? Greek. Greek, okay. Um, but as Christianity spreads... The New Testament is going to be translated into Latin. Coptic, where do we find Coptic? Egypt. Egypt. Coptic is in Egypt, okay? The Copts, C-O-P-T, Copts still live in Egypt today. They account for about 10% of the Egyptian population, and they are, anybody know, Muslims or not? No, no. They're not, they're Christians, Christians, uh, in quotation marks, okay? Um, they're Christians living in Egypt, about 10% of the population. Um, Gothic, language is that? The Goths. 
Okay, the Goths. Who are those folks? Germanic. It's a Germanic tribe. Okay, so we've got with it being translated in Gothic, it's getting translated into the precursor languages um, that are related to English. Okay, um, other languages as well, but these are the most significant for our purposes this evening because these are all very early translations. Syriac, probably second to third century. Latin, third to fourth century. Coptic, probably a little bit later. Gothic, not that much later because the Goths are already interacting with the Roman Empire. Okay? Ancient translations are valuable for New Testament studies because they can be compared to each other for accuracy. They can be compared back and you can actually rebuild texts. Okay? You can understand what was there underneath it, uh, underneath the text. So, um, that's why ancient languages are important, and they are used for comparative studies. All right, so let's continue on. No other ancient book has as many surviving handwritten copies as does the New Testament. In fact, there are over 25,000 portions of the New Testament that survive today in Greek or translation into other languages. Okay, So there are, for example, 5,700 plus in Greek. Now, those are not complete manuscripts. I want to make sure that I'm very clear about that. Remember the word here, portions. You can underline that. Portions of the New Testament, okay? But we get 5,700 and, and counting, and counting in Greek. About 10,000 plus in Latin. About 9,300 plus in other languages. Those are those translations. That's a pretty sick, I mean, Latin is a translation as well. So you take those Together, and we actually probably have, um, not probably, we have more portions of the New Testament in these early translations than we do in the original Greek. Okay? So those are pretty significant in going back and comparing, uh, looking for, for what's going on there in Greek. Now let me ask you a question, and we're going to get to this also in this class. 5,700 manuscripts in Greek and counting. That's a significant word, and counting, okay? Because they do find, I want to just pull up here because I think I had some notes written about this. Um, they do have, I don't have any written notes written about that, sorry. Um, they do find new manuscripts. It was not that long ago, not that long ago. I'm talking about in the last 20 years, probably earlier, probably less than that, that they uncovered more manuscripts in Albania of all places. Okay. And the reason they found them in Albania was because Albania was a Stalinist regime. They weren't even a part of the they weren't even a part of the Iron Curtain. These people were so Stalinist up until they threw off communism that they were pretty much a closed country. You just didn't get into Albania. And scholars didn't get to go in Albania. They didn't get to go into the monasteries and see what manuscripts were there. So they found uh, some more recently in this monastery in Albania. So there's still the potential of finding new manuscripts as time goes on. Okay, um, So, over 25,000 portions of the New Testament. Uh, now I have the information. I just need to pull to the next slide. New manuscripts are found every year. Usually only two to three of those are in Greek. Okay, and When I talk about manuscripts, I don't mean a complete manuscript. It could just be a little tiny fragment, but it's clearly New Testament, so it goes into that count. Here we go. 2007. That was my year. That ah, was more than 20 years. That was less than 20 years. Just under 20 years. Um, 47 additional Greek manuscripts were discovered in Albania. Uh, again, that had been a closed country during the Cold War. So 47 is a significant amount. Okay, Those are not first century manuscripts. A manuscript, by definition, is a handwritten copy. When did copies stop being handwritten? The when the printing press was invented and, and spread, okay? And once printing took over, then you don't have manuscripts like you had before. So some manuscripts are late. Some manuscripts are in the 1300s. They still count in that, all right? Um, I'm not sure about the dating of those. I don't think they're real, real recent, but they're also not first century manuscripts, at least not that I remember. Again, many manuscripts are fragmentary. Don't think, you know, a complete edition of the Gospel of John here. We're finding another one of those every year. No, we don't, but we find fragments, okay? The majority of Greek manuscripts date from the 9th to the 16th century, but many are much older, okay? So you've got a whole bunch in Greek that are dating to this period of 9th to 16th century. 
16th century is after the inventing of the printing press, but of course when Gutenberg invents his first printing press, it takes a while for there to be other printing presses, right? They're expensive. It's like when the first Model T rolled off the assembly line, how many people had cars? Not a whole lot at first. Most were still riding horses and pulling buggies, okay, pulling wagons. Um, same with a printing press. Once you had one, you're going to have others, but it takes a while for that to become widespread. So up into the 16th century, you still got manuscripts. So majority come from that period, but some are much, much older than that. We'll see a picture here in a minute. The earliest known fragment from the New Testament dates to about 125 AD. It is given the name P52. Anybody happen to know what P might stand for? It refers to the material. It's oh papyrus. Okay? It's a papyrus fragment, and it's given the number 52. It was originally from a codex. It had double-sided writing. Okay? So there was writing on there's writing on both sides of this fragment. The fragment itself is from the Gospel of John, and therefore it is only 40 years after composition. Remembering that the Gospel of John is composed somewhere around 85 to 90 AD. This fragment dates to 125. So it is 40 years after the composition of the Gospel of John. Hold your question just a second. Let me pull up the next couple of points on each question. Okay? It was discovered in Egypt, not Asia Minor. That is also significant because where is the Gospel of John composed? Asia Minor. In Asia Minor. And 40 years later, there is now a copy of it in Egypt, and we have a fragment of it. Dad, your question? Yeah, when you said the fragment from the Gospel of John, is there, what is the, what does the fragment describe, basically? I'll, I think I've got a picture over here in just a second. Pull that. Okay, so this P52 from 125. So here's, I, I think we've talked about this before, you've mentioned it before, but the Iliad, so just to guess. Oh, I'm going to get there. Oh, about get the there. fragments of that. I'm going to yeah. get there. You, it's, it, it, if you look a little bit farther, you'll get it. It's oh, okay. <laughs> next, it's one, if it's not in this lesson, I think it is. Keep going. Keep going. There. We're going to get to it. See? Uh -huh. All the way down. Okay? <laughs> All right. That's yes, I talk, a, I talk about that a lot. I talk about it's that a lot. It's right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the two oldest complete slash nearly complete New Testament texts date to within 300 years of writing. All right? These are no longer fragments. These are complete these two are complete or nearly complete copies of the New Testament. And they're within 300 years of writing. All right, so to add it to your question, here we go. This is Papyrus 52 or P52 dating to about 125 AD. It is a fragment that contains John chapter 18 verses 31 through 33 on the front. And on the back, it contains John chapter 18, verses 37 through 38. So you're looking at the Greek text here. All right? This is from John 18, 31 and 33, 31 through 33. It's not the whole, okay? It's fragmentary. See? That word just cut, cut off. But there's enough words that they can identify where it's from in the New Testament, okay? John chapter 18, verses 37 through 38, on this side again. There's still fragments. See, it's just, it's just reversed. Okay, It's a photograph of both sides. Um, that's where it's coming from. All right? So, that's our oldest, currently our oldest, papyrus fragment from the New Testament. Could they find older? Oh, well, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. There's lots of stuff in Egypt still buried. Lots of stuff in Egypt still buried. Okay? Papyrus was used for a whole lot of things. Somebody would come along maybe and use it to write something else on. Okay, um, So there's absolutely the potential of finding something older than this. This is not John's handwriting, in case anybody's going to ask that question. This is not John's handwriting. We don't have any fragments <laughs> in the handwriting of the authors. Lisa, your question. Did the scribes sign their name? They did not. They did not. They did not sign their names, at least not with any regularity. Uh, but interestingly enough, just like our handwriting is recognizable, sometimes scribes' handwriting is recognizable as well. And so they can look at a couple of different manuscripts and know that they were from the same scribe. Does it say where these were found? 
in Egypt. In Egypt. Which is where the majority of papyrus is found. Just those two pieces. Oh, no, no, they found lots of papyrus in Egypt. This is just the oldest. Yeah, but I'm talking about with John because it's just interesting that that you, you know, there's two key verses there that are skipped that are not there. Well, they're not there because it's missing. I know. Okay. And they didn't find that. They haven't found the other. No, otherwise it would be tacked onto that. They sometimes, sometimes you will see manuscripts and there'll be a piece here and a piece here because they know they go together. This case, it stands on its own. I don't think there's any other fragments that go anywhere with this. But that's what survived of this copy of the Gospel of John. And if you look, I might just point this out. Um, papyrus is made by laying strips from the plant one way and then the other way. And they're, it's processed so they stick together. And if you kind of look at this, if you look at that section that's missing, that's like a strip of that papyrus. Okay, Not here, but down here it is. Papyrus is a very, uh, like paper, it's a very fragile material. Right? And so even in Egypt, where it has a better chance of being preserved, it's still not 100% preservation because bugs and things like that. By the way, I'll tell you where you will not find papyrus. You will not find papyrus fragments. And I'm going to risk here being found out to be a liar. Okay. <laughs> Um, you will generally, how about now? I'm going to make my, my waffle statement there. You will generally never find papyrus fragments in England. It's just too wet. Okay? These, in order to be preserved, need a dry environment. And so that's where you tend to find it in drier areas. Okay? Some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are on papyrus. The Dead Sea is a very dry environment. Right? You're not going to find papyrus fragments in jungles or rainforests. They just don't tend to survive under those, under those circumstances. So is that like in a museum in Egypt? Uh, no, I'm not real, real sure who owns the P-52. Some of these papyruses are held in libraries. There are some in England. Okay, I'm not particularly, I'm not certain where this one is held. So we some of these them in England. No. What? <laughs> this one's in Manchester. You will not excavate them in England. At least not very many. This was in Manchester? Manchester, England at the John Rylands Research okay. Institute. Alright, so it's at the John Rylands Library Institute there in Manchester. Okay. Um, and so you get some, there's a museum in Ireland that has them. And somebody was just posting the other day that they went to that library in the hopes of seeing the fragments and they asked about it and said, oh, we don't have those on display. Oh, yeah, right? I came all the way here to see those fragments. Get out here. Um, because they're, they're valuable. And so it's just like, you know, it's just like uh, if, you, if you want to go see the Constitution of the United States in D.C., it's all behind glass. It's all temperature controlled. They've got guards there for a reason to keep people from doing stupid things. Right? Yeah. Um, because it's fragile. I mean, you know, if you busted open that glass and threw acid on it, well, there went that copy of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of these are, are in private institutions. They sometimes make them available to the public to see, but scholars get a chance to see them. But the good thing about technology today is you don't need to go see them. If you can read Greek, you know exactly what those fragments say. Technology has done wonders for scholars being able to study manuscripts without actually having to go there to do it. All right, good question. Any other questions? All right, we'll pull up the next slide. Four of our most important New Testament manuscripts, we're going to see a picture here or a couple pictures here in a second. One of those is the Codex Sinaiticus. It dates to the mid-fourth century, so about 350 A.D. It, it contains about half of the Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? The Greek translation. Okay, so the Old Testament in Greek. And the Septuagint was the Old Testament of most early Christians. Okay? Certainly, early Christians who were not Jewish. And even a lot of Jewish early Christians, it was their Bible. Okay? So, the Codex Sinaiticus is an attempt to get all of the New Testament and the Old Testament together in one manuscript. It would be what we would call what? A Bible. A Bible. Okay? Um, it does have all of the New Testament, contains about half the Septuagint. So, it's important for Old Testament studies as well. By the way, this particular codex, a whole interesting story behind that. A guy named Tischendorf, who is German, 
goes to uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, which is in Sinai, hence the name Sinaiticus. And he is in his room there. He's under the um, patronage of the Tsar of Russia. This is in the 1800s. Okay? He's there in his room, and he's, he's kicking around in the monastery. He sees that the monks have paper scraps in a wastebasket. Because papyrus scraps are, and animal scraps are really, really good for... Fuel for fire. Starting fires. Okay. He discovers this manuscript there. And he has to be really, really careful about this. Because if the monks catch wind of the fact that it's valuable, then they might just take it away from him. So he gets to research it some while he's there. Um, and eventually it's purchased and taken out of the monastery. That's why it's named that. Again, Sinai is what kind of environment? Dry. Really dry. Okay, this particular one is not papyrus; it's animal skin. But still, animal skin is preserved in a dry environment better than a wet environment as well. Take your leather shoes, leave them out in the rain tonight. With the rain that's coming, they're not going to look real great tomorrow morning, are they? Leave them out there, submerged in the bucket. And they're really not going to look great. Just doesn't do well for leather. Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, dates to the fourth century, so it's roughly the same time as Sinaiticus. It contains the Septuagint. Again, that's the Old Testament in Greek, as well as most of the New Testament. Okay, So it's got the Old Testament in Greek, and it's got most of the New Testament in one book. All right. Next one is called the Codex Alexandrinus. It dates to the early 5th century. It contains most of the Septuagint and the New Testament. And then we have the Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. Say that five times in a row. It dates to the 5th century. Much of the Old Testament is missing and the New Testament is incomplete. But it's still a substantially large amount of the New Testament. By the way, I'll just throw this out here. Anybody have an idea what the scriptus means? Copies. <laughs> rewrite. It's a rewrite. That's exactly what it is. It's a rewrite. This is a manuscript that had been something else. Something else had been written on this manuscript, on these parchment, on these animal skins. Someone then came along and decided, we're going to have a copy of the Bible. Uh, but parchment is, is expensive. So what's the easier way and the cheaper way? Erase the old stuff. Basically, erase the old stuff. And it's a lot harder than getting out a little rubber eraser and doing it. But you erase all of that, and then you use it again. Okay. Or what also happened was, and this may be the case in this one, I'm not sure which way it went, is that somebody had a Bible and said, I want a copy of the Iliad. And so they erase the Bible to write the Iliad. And modern imaging technology allows us to see what the text was underneath it. Okay. Again, remembering, not everybody in the ancient world would look at that and say, that's something special to me. Somebody who's a pagan would say, I care nothing about this. I want this. Let's do this. Okay, And so it's, it's erased. And there are, uh, I'll just say, quite a few manuscripts that are done that way, that are recopies. And again, our modern imaging technology allows us to actually see the text that was underneath because it's never completely erased. Charlotte? How many people were reading like them? In the ancient world, people were not as illiterate as we think. Okay. okay. This is still before what's called the Dark Ages. But the Dark Ages is really kind of a misnomer because the Dark Ages really weren't all that dark. And there was still a lot of learning going on. Um, Alexandrinus is from Alexandria. Not sure where that one's from. Sinaiticus is from Sinai. Vaticanus gets that name because it's housed in the Vatican Museum. So these would have been places where there would have been some people that were literate. But in any case, these are works that were commissioned by wealthy people. Or by the church. Okay, so if you look at this, this is the Codex Sinaiticus from the mid-4th century. It's a substantial book. Sometimes books like that would be found in churches, okay, where the priests or whoever would read from them. And they would be readers, the priests. Sure. They would, oh yes. They, Certainly in this period, they would be readers. Religious people, I mean, religious hierarchies were the ones that were using these things. Yes, yes. The pagans who had money weren't interested in making copies of Bibles. They were making copies of the Iliad and things like that that were valuable to them. So this would have been wealthy Christians who were having this done. And it could be 
it could be nobles that are having this done. It had to have required money because you've got all these, this is parchment, this is animal skin. And you've got to make the animal skin. And there's a process with that. Then you've got to have a scribe that's going to go in and copy it. Right? And that's expensive because scribes were professionals. But not many people were reading, right? Now, what would happen in the churches is people would read it out loud. Okay? Um, in, the, in, the, in the gospel, in the book of John, John says at the beginning, I think it's at the beginning, of, maybe the words of Jesus, it's going to be read, blessed are, how's it worded? Um, they're told to read it aloud. Okay? Yeah. So when the, the, the letter of the Revelation gets to Ephesus, they read it out loud. The church comes together and they read it out loud. I suspect then they make a copy of it before they send it up the road because they want their own copy of it. But they're going to send it. It's a circle or it's a circular letter, so it's going to go on. But the good thing is, Ephesus makes their copy. They send it up the road. The next church up the road gets it. They read it. They make a copy. By the time it's made the route of seven, you got seven copies now in the book of Revelation. So um, that's what that's what's happening with these writings. You know, you get a letter from Paul. That's valuable. Corinth gets a letter from Paul, even though he's, you know, telling them they really need to straighten up. It's a valuable letter. We make copies of that. Other people get to read that. So, um, but it's generally speaking, um, generally speaking, that reading aloud was important because not everybody was literate. Literacy was more widespread than we sometimes give credit for the ancient world. That was what I was. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, later in history, you ever wondered why there's so many stained glass windows in Catholic churches? They told, the story of the Bible. they told the story of the Bible because later on, when a lot of people really are not literate, the priest reads, but you know, how much can the priest read at one time? So you go into the Catholic church, the local church, and there are stories in art and the stained glass visual. You've got the stations of the cross. Really yes. Have- Yes, that tell the tell the story of Jesus. Um, so, the, so there's one other thing that there's like huge libraries. That's the other thing that actually does occur during this time. Like there's a huge library in Alexandria. Yes, I've been to the library. We've been mm-hmm. to the library in Ephesus. There, I mean, then there's another one that was in Pergamum. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I mean, there are. The centers of intellectual thought and study um, all throughout the ancient world. Yeah, I mean, but they were not lending libraries. You no. couldn't go in and say, hey, I want a copy of that to take home with me. But they they are, were there for study. But they are collecting. And the the loss of the library in Alexandria was a, a huge loss because they were actually pulling, I think Alexandria was one of the ones that was trying to pull um, to books and, and right information there. from all over all these other different places and compiling them in one spot. Well, I think they said Alexandria, Ephesus is the second largest library. That, I mean, possible. But, I mean, these the libraries were important. Monasteries were important later. But by their very nature, I mean, the problem is, um, boy, the Vikings land on your seashore. Hmm. How many can you get out of their way before they torture church? So that's why there's a lot of stuff that hasn't survived because you've got, I, I'm not, you know, making anything to anybody here's Norse, I'm not making fun of the Norse. Um, but uh, they were, you know, doing that a lot up on the Ireland and Scotland and England. But World War II, World War I, any of these major wars, especially with explosives, okay, um, how, why does the Parthenon look so terrible today in Athens? Yeah, because the Turks use it as an ammo dump, okay, and the Hawkman's caught on fire because it was an ammo store, right? That's like, why does Israel go into Gaza and attack a hospital? Because Hamas is down in the basement. Okay, when you do that, you know, don't be surprised when your hospital gets attacked. So, in the ancient, in the ancient and in the modern world, these things get destroyed. What happens in England when Germany and England are war, World War II? They take a lot of the stuff and they put it away. They get it out of London. They get it out of places that are going to be bombed. Germany does the same thing. Germany takes a lot of its treasures, okay, and puts them underground. Um, the Berlin, the artifacts of the Berlin Museum were probably removed from Berlin during that time because Berlin was bombed heavily by us and by the Russians. Okay. So some things, some things are lost over the centuries 
These are just the things that have survived, and an incredible number of these have survived. It's too bad me being, me being some here because I think that there's a similar thing in China about library systems and collection of... Oh, that would not surprise me because writing has existed in China for so long that I would expect that it would be there. But, you know, the problem is, is that sometimes you get some kind of fanatical regime that says we should burn books and things like that, and you lose some of that. Okay? And there have been people like that for a long time. Um, one of the questions of the canon that we'll talk to later, which books belong in the New Testament, that was important because the Roman authorities said, surrender copies of your sacred writings so we can burn them. And so Christians had to, and Christians by and large didn't want to do that, obviously. And so the question became, what's really a part of the New Testament? And if we've got this letter over here that really isn't a part of the New Testament, let's give the Romans that, okay? And we'll protect the New Testament itself. And so it's, you have this, it goes on over and over, and it goes on across cultures um, that, that people will do things like that. Okay. My, my mind just doesn't grasp all this. I have it where I can look at it, and that is not something that for ages hasn't been done. It, that is correct. And we live in a, God's plan has been around, and the, those people didn't have access to it. I wouldn't say they didn't have access to it. I would say access was much more difficult. Much more difficult. We really live in a blessed time that we have. I mean, I'm sitting here, you have your phone right there. Do you have a Bible on your phone? Absolutely. I mean, that was something that 100 years ago would have been mind-boggling to have that. The, the, what we have, the, our technology, our abilities today. Do you see what I'm saying, though, about back there and then here and God's plan was so hard to get you there and now we have it so yeah and I, that bothers me it, it bothers me that people aren't trying hard to get to it when it's so easy for them uh, maybe it bothers you that in times past people had to work harder at it and didn't have it easily they did not have it easily and it's how many did but maybe, it made, maybe it made them value it more Probably made them value it more, and those who were seeking had to had to work harder at seeking it. But sometimes what you seek, sometimes what you work harder for is more valuable. I mean, that's a whole debate, isn't it, in our society today? When we make things easy for young people, for children, when we make things easy for our children, what? They give up. They stop. They don't know how to work at things that are difficult. So when something comes along that's difficult, I can't do this. Okay. Um, that's not that's that's not, that's not good. I, I remember my parents when I got my first car, they loaned me the two thousand dollars it cost me to buy that whatever that was. <laughs> it was some little Japanese car, and and I I worked a job and I paid it back every last penny. You didn't pay interest. <laughs> that's, that's because it would be terribly unchristian to charge your son interest. Okay? But I paid back every penny of it. But I was expected to go out and work. And pay that off. I paid my own insurance. Too bad it wasn't a jubilee. <laughs> I sold it too quickly for the jubilee to come along. Okay, I only had it for probably about a year, and then I sold it to a guy I worked with. And right after I sold it, <laughs> the transmission went out. <laughs> I didn't know that. Buyer beware, right? Um, so people in the ancient world that were looking had to value it more. But you know. Even a priest reading from God's word in the church, if people were listening, they could have understood some things. Interestingly enough, you had movements in the Middle Ages against what the Catholic Church was doing, in spite of the fact that not everybody had their own copy of the Bible. That people did see that there was something not right with this. So this is Sinaiticus, and that's the original. That's a photograph of the original. I want you to just point out that that is very legible text. Okay, Those who can manage Greek can manage that text very well. By the way, um, it's written in all capital letters because Greek of this period was. You notice there are no gaps in the words because there were not. Okay. Um, and that's how it's written. It's written in four columns, and they're front and back pages. Another manuscript. This is the Codex Vaticanus. This is a facsimile. Okay, if you got about four thousand dollars, 
You can go out and buy a facsimile. That's a copy. Okay? Done, but it's not like a photocopy. It's a copy of the original. You can go out and buy one if you want to. I don't know why you want to, unless you just have a lot of money and anything else to do with it. But um, that's a facsimile edition. Sometimes libraries will have these. They're valuable in libraries. Okay? This particular uh, codex, by the way, is available online. They've actually digitalized the whole thing, so you can go to the Vatican website and you can actually pull up images, these high-resolution images of Vaticanus. Again, that means that scholars have access to this without having to fly to the Vatican, get permission to actually see the manuscript, because I can assure you, you probably had better be a scholar of some standing to get an opportunity to see that. I can tell you, if I called the Vatican and said, hey, I'm going to be in Rome next week, I will stop in, you know, flip a few pages on that, I think I'd get sphered by the Swiss Guard or something, because you just don't get to do that, all right? Um, but now with it being online, lots of ability to do things like that. Um, I've made the statement before that I've traced Ivana's genealogy in the Czech Republic in these books that are 150, 200 years old that come out of the churches where births, deaths, and marriages were recorded, and they would let us handle those, but there was nothing valuable about them other than the fact they're just books from that time period. They've now digitalized all of that, and so now I could do all of our family research from right here online. I don't have to go over there anymore. But when I was doing it, I had to go to the archives. And I had to request this book, this book, and this book, and they bring it to me. Um, so, again, technology is allowing us to do a lot of things that we could not have done, even, you know, I moved here 16 years ago, and I was doing that about five years before I moved here. So that was 20 years ago. By the way, why the interest, you might know, just for, for free, why the interest in digitalizing birth, death, and marriage records? Ancestry. Uh, ancestry is part of it, but they're not the ones paying to digitalize it. You know who's paying to digitalize a lot of these? The Mormons are. Because in order to baptize someone, in order to baptize your ancestor, baptize for your ancestor, to give them a chance to accept Mormonism, you have to know their date of birth or date of death. And so they're digitalizing this so that members of their church can go into a temple, a Mormon temple, and be baptized for the dead. It's a very particular Mormon thing, so that then that person gets an opportunity to accept the gospel, which in their view is the Mormon, um, and they get to be saved, even though they weren't until then. So that's uh, genealogy. If any of your family history, a lot of it is tied to Latter day Saints, even here in the States. Yeah, they have you know, vested the interest in all that. And all their um, steakhouses and stuff have. Areas where you can go in and, and order stuff as a broadcast. And it's all because of that baptism for the dead. I mean, it's a doctrine that's driving a huge, mm -hmm. what must be very expensive for them to do. But all the rest of us benefit because we get to see some of these things. But anyway, that's a fast simile. It is available online. All right, so ancient literature in the New Testament. This is our chart. Um, author, when written earliest copy, time span, number of copies. We'll just pull it up here. Aristotle writes 350 BC. The earliest copy is 1100 AD. The time span is 1,450 years. The number of copies of Aristotle is 49. Plato writes in 400 BC. Earliest copy, 900 AD. That's a span of 1,300 years. And are we ready for this? We have a fat whopping seven copies of Plato. Homer writes the Iliad, 900 BC. Earliest copy is 400 BC. That's a 500-year span, 643 copies. Now, what is significant about that is that the Iliad was the Bible of the Greeks. It was the Bible of the ancient Greeks. It told all about their mythology. It told what their gods were like. The Iliad was really, really important for the Greeks. And that's what we got. Okay? The New Testament, 50 to 100 A.D., earliest copy, 350 A.D., Time span of 250 years. And we have 25,000 plus and counting manuscripts, fragmentary or otherwise. By the way, not all of those are complete manuscripts. Okay. And I will tell you that when I was at the University of Dallas, we had to study Aristotle. I had, I had to take four years of philosophy. I hated Aristotle. I still hate Aristotle. Okay. Um, but I had to have four years of him. Four years of Plato. No professor ever said, we're going to read Aristotle and Plato, but we don't really know if this is what they wrote. 
It was just taken as a given. That's what Aristotle and Plato wrote. Same with the Iliad. Now that I did enjoy reading. Okay, we had to read that in my freshman year. I did like that. Um, same thing. No one ever came in and said, well, you know, we're not real, real sure that Homer actually really wrote that. Maybe it was corrupted or changed. And yet we come to the New Testament and people say, it's been changed. Yeah, it's been changed. We can't trust it. We can't believe it. And we have more evidence numerically and time-wise than we have for any other ancient work. And it is an astounding gap between the two. And this is significant because the Iliad was the Bible for ancient Greeks. And even at that, 500 year gap, 643 copies. And the New Testament, can't say exponentially higher, it's not exponentially higher, it's multiplicities higher as far as copies. Huh? What about things like the Epic of Gilgamesh and those types of... Oh, those are, you're talking about a couple, probably Epic of Gilgamesh, maybe five. Maybe five tablets. Ten tops. I wouldn't guess more than ten. It was important in Mesopotamia. And they uncovered a lot of these cuneiform, but it doesn't even come close to Homer. It's probably more on the order of Aristotle and Plato. So it's just, these are big works that were important. Aristotle and Plato was important in the ancient world. Okay, People read him. They read them. Aristotle, his philosophy is believe it or not, highly influential in our Western society today. Okay? So even though he's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I took philosophy for four years. I passed every year. I don't know how I passed every year. I guess the professor was nice and just passed all of us stupid people. Um, because I really have no idea most of the time what either one of those two guys were saying. The Iliad, I got. These guys, not so much. Well, he's right? Alexander's too. Yeah. Aristotle. Yes, Aristotle was. Okay. Yeah, he's the one that told... Um, Alexander, that be really nice to the Greeks, but ruthless to everyone else. Treat them like plants and animals. Um, so, I <laughs> didn't get quoted a whole lot from Aristotle. Did you know that? Yeah. Very influential works, but the New Testament is exponentially more important. So, as we look at the New Testament, we have our autographs. Those are actually written by the author, 50 to 180. We don't have any of those. Then we have the Greek manuscripts, 2nd to the 16th century AD. Okay? They're a witness to the original text. Then we have the versions, not Greek. Second to the ninth century. Then we have, and I want to finish with this this evening, before that bell rings, even rings stay, okay? Patristic quotations. Second to the fourth century. Patristic means they come from the early church fathers. The early church fathers were all these Christian leaders, men, okay? Priests, bishops, and others who wrote about the New Testament and the Old Testament. They wrote commentaries. And when they wrote commentaries, what was I saying though? First. 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 Good. When they wrote commentaries, they quoted from the book they were commenting on. If we lost all of those tomorrow, if by some weird cataclysmic event, every Greek manuscript existing spontaneously combusted, and if all of these did too, and if all of your printed Bibles did too, okay, but these remain, the New Testament could be put back together from these quotations. Okay? Early Christians quoted extensively from the Bible. And so there's enough evidence there to reconstruct what's missing. And by the way, that's a, that is a witness to the text. So if we're not real, real sure what this particular verse, because we got like five different versions of it, what it was originally. By the way, we probably got a lot more than five on a given verse. Okay, we're talking about that. Not this topic, the next topic. This is a witness. So what did Irenaeus, writing in the second, second century, what did he write about the book of Romans? What did his quotes look like? Understanding that during this period, People were very free with their quotations. Okay? The New Testament is very free with its quotations. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when the New Testament quotes from the Old, it doesn't exactly read like your Old Testament does? There's a reason for that. Today, in our modern world, we quote exactly. New Testament writers didn't. And ancient writers didn't. Sometimes they paraphrased. Okay? Does that bother us? Shouldn't, because who's inspiring the New Testament writers? God, 
And so, if they write it that way, then I guess God was okay with that in their case. Now, am I going to paraphrase? I sometimes do. All right? But I'm not inspired. So you better watch it with my paraphrases. It's one of the New Testament paraphrases we're okay with that. Because God's doing that. All right. So we're going to pick up right here, Sunday morning, the question of the canon. Okay? We're going to go through that. What books belong in the Bible? What books belong in the Bible? How do you know what books belong in the Bible? The Catholic Bible has more books than yours does. The Greek Orthodox Church has more books in its Bible than you do. So do they belong there or don't they belong there? And how do you know? That's the question of the canon. And it's really, really important. And we're going to talk about it Sunday. 